there will be a requirement to need human connection and companies are going to win more customers on their ability to build human connections with their with their customers. Welcome to Unexpected Journey, the show where each week top professionals share work wisdom and life lessons about their careers and what they have learned about human experience in the workplace. I'm your host, Ann Bibb. On today's show, we welcome Arthur Nowak, founder and CEO of Exceed, a visionary leader with over 25 years in the customer experience and BPO industry. Arthur has a diverse background that includes starting as a frontline associate and progressing towards leading large teams of over 25,000 employees across the globe. Arthur co-founded Exceed to challenge traditional BPO norms, and his passion lies in blending frontline expertise with cutting edge digital technologies to create transformative, frictionless customer experiences. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe and leave your comments below. Now let's get started. Welcome back to Unexpected Journey. Today, I have the honor of being joined by Arthur Nowak, who is the founder and CEO of Exceed. Now, you look at that and you might want to say something else, but I have been corrected. It is actually called Exceed. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> So, Arthur, tell me the story behind that, because I know that there was like this whole conversation about how the company, what what the name of the company was going to be and how it was going to be pronounced. You know, you get you get very wrapped up in in, in a name when you're um, creating a company and what you're going to call yourself. Right. And uh we went through various different versions of, of a name. I won't go through the other names because they might stick, right? Um, but the, the impetus about this name was uh, we wanted to do something around customer experience, right? And so CX started to become a component of, you know, two letters we wanted to incorporate into our name somehow. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted it to be a common term that people uh, would would use regularly. Um, and so exceed is like exceeding goals, exceeding targets, exceeding expectations, exceeding your dreams. It, you know, that's that's really what the name is, is, is all about. Um, and we do that relative to, you know, customer experience. And so. Um, if I were to break down the name and give you the science behind the name, there's uh, science. There there's is a science. science. You know, we have we always have to have some <laughs> logic here, right? Um, so the the lowercase i is a nod to you know the iPhone, iMessage, anything i, uh, and it's a nod to technology and how it's been integrated and how we approach customer experience a little bit differently. Um, and the CX is customer experience. It's a very commonly used uh, abbreviation. Um, and then the word itself is 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 about exceed and 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 how we exceed expectations and goals and and targets. So in all of that complication, <laughs> we created a name uh, that uh, a lot of people have questioned how to uh, pronounce it. And in fact, we have a little funny series coming out on our social media around um, all the different pronunciations of our name that we've heard and how they're incorrect. Um, but we wanted to make a little bit fun of it because apparently others <laughs> have experienced the same thing. <laughs> you know what? Um, humor is, leaning into it is a good thing. Yeah. Um, I am, you, you know, you've been in the outsourcing industry just for a minute. And just briefly, you know, I just which... my toe into it. Exactly. And I, I'm curious, though, why did you choose the customer experience industry as the focus of not only your business, but your career? Mm. Well, I didn't choose it as my career, to be 100% honest. So um, how it how it all started was, you know, it was it was paying the bills and, you know, allowing me to 
you know, drink beer and buy pizza during college, um, as well as have a little bit of extra spending. There's some honesty for you. <laughs> yeah, that's true honesty. This is these this is this is the advice for everyone who's trying to select a career out there. Um, you know, follow the path that pays for beer. Um, no, so I it it was a job that you know I felt I was doing well. I had a little bit of a knack to it. It was paying the bills. Um, I did not expect it to really turn into a career. It was really intended um, at the time that I joined. It intended to be just a placeholder while I was going to college. However, what ended up happening is that as I started to feel more uh, inclined towards this type of work, uh, and started to, you know, be challenged by different aspects of customer experience because people don't really realize that there's there's a lot more than just answering the phone. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to actually orchestrate, you know, customer journeys and to make these things, you know, happen in a in a contact center. And as you start to explore more of that, you my curious mind was enchant you know enchanted by it and i wanted to learn more and so i always kind of applied myself towards you know different roles and 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 functions because of curiosity mostly and in fact college almost took a backseat here i'm giving great advice to all the people pursuing school and education today um it it almost took a backseat because i was so challenged in the workplace that it became about the experiences I was having in work were actually more of a learning experience for me than what I was doing in college at the time. Um, college was more like the reinforcement. I, I, I'm still an advocate of getting a degree, right? Let me, let me put that out there. Um, but for me, I, I felt like I was learning more because of this path. And so I really doubled down on that. And then I always wanted college as that, uh, you know, that reinforcement and some credentials that said, you know, I can do this, right? That was, that was more, uh, more reinforcement, but the learning was happening on the job and I couldn't stop. I relocated, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I, for just to pursue different opportunities, I relocated probably five or six times within the, um, within five years of turning 18, right? So by 23, I had become an expert mover and, you know, moved to Florida, Arizona, Montana, West Virginia, uh, Colorado. And uh, I did that all in the pursuit of curiosity, learning, and just trying to challenge myself and do more. And along that way, along, not just through those moves, were you experiencing customer experience, right? Because you were having to move, you were going through all of these transitions of finding a location for where to live. And, mm -hmm. but throughout all of this and throughout the journey, you have seen customer experience transform through the years. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. What, you know, t what have you seen throughout all of this? Well, when I, when I started the, the primary channel of support was voice and, you know, you would have, uh, I think it was just at the dawn. I mean, my first job in a inbound contact center, I started out in an outbound telemarketing, but, uh, in an inbound contact center, my first job was, uh, converting people to online banking. And at that time, that was a very big thing for customers. And so there was a special, you know, queue where customers would be routed to people like me and I would help customers, you know, set up their username and their password and get into their online bank and step by step today, you don't think about that today. We set up online, you know, logins like nobody's business, you know, we're, we're giving away emails and passwords. I can't remember all my passwords. To some That's kind of like the time when all of a the sudden there was a transition, not just to online banking, but to auto pay. There was oh, yeah. like this mass shift for companies. Well, that came next, right? So online right? banking just got you to, I could transfer money. I could view my accounts. 
And then auto pay was the next big transformation in the, in the financial services industry. Um, you know, the idea I could pay my bills automatically without writing a check that was transformational. Uh, and it was it was interesting to watch the customers and the reactions, the different reactions, because there were those that were like, I don't want auto pay because I don't know if there will be money in my account. And then there were the customers that were, this is so nice because I don't have to remember to pay my bill. Yeah. There was just the full swing. I've, I've learned that you never get 100 percent adoption of anything right uh, up front. There's always skeptics. There's always people who, you know, who hold back. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, I think people, people can decide what's more comfortable for them. I'm actually, to be fair, I, you know, uh, I'm a person who likes a, who likes a routine. And when I, when somebody makes a suggestion to change, like, for example, my morning routine, it may be the right suggestion. It might be something like, you know, floss your teeth in the morning. Uh, and even though it's <laughs> the right suggestion, if my routine doesn't have that incorporated, I'm going to take a while to like really incorporate it into my, into my, um, into my routine. And in some, in some ways I can understand people who are laggards in, in, in adopting, you know, the next, the next wave of thing. And you're right. It, there's a mix of people. Uh, ultimately the convenience won in the end, right? Ultimately people saw more convenience in online banking, bill pay, not going to the, to the, to the teller. And, I'm sure there are probably people who still are holdouts on that, and that's fine. Uh, but I, you know, I've seen that transformation firsthand. I've seen the concerns that people have as you know new technologies are are introduced, and I've seen the excitement that people have when they see the convenience and the time that it saves them in their in their busy lives. So um, it's a double edged sword, and you know the world. The world is also an interesting place now. I think we're right in the middle of another, you know, massive transformation with the with the impacts of AI. And I think you see the the same. There's skepticism. There are advocates. There are people who are throwing caution to the wind. Uh, and I think these are important discussions to be having. I, I you know, I I don't lean one way or another. I think it's important to to hear out all opinions and all perspectives and and to try to incorporate that in future strategies, because ultimately um, I do think it's, it's, it's extremely transformational and that transformational does come, that transformation does come with risk um, as well as benefit. And you have to look at both sides of the, the equation as we, as we move through probably the next decade or two. So leading a customer experience organization when there is essentially constant change, because let's face it, that's, that's basically the only constant when it comes to cons customer experience. Customers are constantly changing based on what's happening in the world, what's happening with technology, what's happening in their lives. There's always something moving. So as you, the CEO of an organization, and you're dealing with your clients, how do you balance that? the needs of your clients, the needs of their customers, trying to balance all of that and then moving forward with your employees that then have to deliver. Uh, so you, you have to build a, cult, a culture of change management um, in, a, in a customer experience organization uh, because it isn't static. And in fact, probably, you know, the last 10 years have created more dynamicism and change um, and it's a greater volume. I mean, you know, the, 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 the ways um, customers can communicate uh, with different brands now has been evolving and changing. Uh, market, uh, market competition has just intensified, right? Because there's people innovating, there are people disrupting uh, legacy, you know, players in various different industries. And that's creating change because then you get those legacy players who have to adapt and have to um, have to evolve, right? And so change is, change is constant. Uh, you learn that very quickly. And so you have to build a culture of, you know, change management. Uh, that's not for everyone, 
right? That's, that's actually, you know, a, a, a personality trait that you, that we have to look for, right. In terms of individuals who can, who can adapt to change and who can, who are able to be comfortable with change because it is a constant in what we do. And it's part of, part of the right thing to do for the customer, because if a brand evolves and the product offering changes or uh, something changes around this, the service that's being offered, you know, we have to adapt with it. We have to, we have to be adaptable to it. Um, and customer expectations are changing, which means that what was great service, you know, two years ago is now maybe average service today. And that's because, you know, technology has showed us that you can get immediacy on things, right? I can now go and, you know, pay, pay you and, you know, a bill, if you were to invoice me, um, you know, I could pay. No, so I can just send you an invoice and you're paying. Everybody heard it. You all heard it, here. it. Right. And I'll pay <laughs> it and you get the money. You could even get the money today, right? There's ways for me to get you the money today. Things it's that were unheard of from a timing perspective years ago, and just even maybe a couple years ago, now have become the norm and the expectation. And, and you have to adapt. You have to adapt on both sides of the equation. Um, and that makes it, you know, there's one part of it that makes that a little bit fearful if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not, you know, associated with change. For me, I love it because... I just have always lived my life on learning, evolving, and not being static. And so to me, it kind of just places me where I feel like I need to be, right? I'm in a dynamic environment with constant change. You, you're not sure what's around the corner, but you know that you're going to have to pivot and evolve as things, um, as things move forward. And for me, that's exciting. For me, that's, that's great. For me, that's life. As we're thinking about how much customer experience has evolved in the last 100 years, 80 years, the last five years. What do you think the future of customer experience is? And how do you think that's going to affect outsourcing? Yeah. Uh, so I think I think you're going to see a couple of different trends. And, and I am going to um, I guess, contradict myself a little bit in what I'm, I'm going to say. I think one element you are going to see is the adoption of more uh, what I like to call digital workers. And that what I mean by digital workers is any technology that does, you know, the work that a, that a, that a human used to do. Uh, there's a lot of mundane in customer experience. There's a lot of uh, typing in one system to copy, you know, information into another system. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, moving things from one window to another window in order to just assist the customer to get going. A good example of that is if you've ever been checked in by a gate agent at the at, at an airline, right? I don't know why they type so much because <laughs> when I check in on online, it's like click, 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 click. print. Yep. <laughs> but when they're like, what are they putting in? It's already there. there. They wrote an essay, right? Um, so there's a lot of that, you know. I think that 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 can is going to be moved to digital workers, but at the same time, as we move towards more digitization, I think customer expectations for personalization and being treated as an individual are going to get higher. And that is going to be a dependency on a, on a human labor force. Uh, there will be a requirement to need human connection and companies are going to win more customers on their ability to build human connections with their, with their customers. And, you know, I think it's almost going to come full circle, right? Because contact centers, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this history lesson, right? But if you think about what was happening before contact centers even existed, right? You had mom and pop grocery store in your neighborhood. You had, you know, your regional, you know, bank. And you knew Julie who was there as the bank teller. Um, you had the hardware store that was owned by the neighborhood, 
you know, by the neighborhood gentleman there. Um, and you had a bake shop and, you know, you, you, they were individually owned, you know, businesses in, 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 in your locality, right? And you built relationships. You knew them. You walked in. They knew your order. They knew who you were. You might have even had, you know, a, a, a tab, you know, so you could put things on, on store credit, right? The early days of store credit, which was nothing more than a piece of paper of a good friend that I knew, right? And then contact centers come in and what they start to say is, wait, for businesses who have multiple locations, we want some more consistency. We want the convenience for customers to not actually always have to come into the store, right? And so you have the dawn of, you know, 800 numbers and customers now for the first time have a centralized location where they can get a more consistent experience because maybe the hardware shop in, you know, my town does things one way, but the heart, the same hardware shop with the same brand in another town does things a little bit of a different way. So, you know, unifying things in, in scale, you know, allowed uh, for more consistency. And as you built the scale, right, then people started to say, okay, well, how do we, how do we optimize the processes, the cost for efficiency? And yeah, maybe in certain scenarios, things went a little bit too far, I would argue, right? Too impersonal, too, too, uh, too cost driven, right? I, I do think that there's probably a, a claim for that. But I think the dawn of technology will now allow us to go back to more individualized, personalized experiences, right? And being able to, yeah, maybe I don't know you personally, but I better understand your relationship with the company that I'm, that I'm supporting. And I'm able to treat you almost as if I did know you individually, right? Because I know who you are. I know how long you've been with us. I know your history. I know, you know, I know things about you and this is important to customers. I know this is important to customers because we hear it in the contact center all the time. Do you know? You think there's I'm a fine line though? I mean, between utilizing the data from what we do and how we shop and how we interact with your services, your company, your products to be able to personalize and make our customer experience better. There's to do that versus going too far to seem like big brother and creepy. Like where's, where's the line? Well, I think that line hasn't been drawn. Right. And I think that, um, this is an example where I said earlier that the volume of change has been so rapid and massive that I'm not yet sure that all the social impacts um, have been fully considered. And this would be an example of that, right? The amount of data that exists on a consumer, on a customer, on your internet traffic, on what you do in, in social media sites, that data is, is scary, right? And I'm not sure that the laws, societal norms, uh, societal views have yet quickly adapted to say, this is what is acceptable, or this is, this is what is not. Um, governments are certainly taking, uh, taking steps to try to control the spread of data. Um, you know, Europe, Europe is a, is a good example with, uh, GDPR regulation. Um, you know, so there are steps being taken to move forward. But I don't know that it's as rapid as the change is coming forward. And and it, um, and it seems like people like it's to use what you said earlier, they're contradictory because they want the personalization. They right. want you to know them and to provide that information based on what you know and their behaviors, but they don't want you to take their data and use it. So it's kind right. of like, how do you, how do you provide the personalization and that positive customer experience without using my data? I, so, I mean, one thing I, I do advocate for is I really feel that with technology today, the access to sensitive data, is should not be a necessity or a requirement to provide customer service. So, there are technology solutions today 
that, you know, I no longer need to, I shouldn't have to ask you for your social, for instance, right, to verify who you are. Or, you know, if you want to make a payment over the phone to secure your credit card details and then your billing address and all these other, you know, pers this personal information that I think ultimately should be kept private. Um, for me, what I, what I talk about is it's, it's, it's risk to have access to that kind of data, um, risk for the customer, risk for the person who's, who's, who has access to it and risk for the brand who's providing that access. And there are technology solutions that allow you to interact with technology and it takes this information out of the hands of a human. So this would be an example where technology could actually enhance our security of private information because you interact with the technology when that exchange of private information is required versus interacting with me. Um, and anytime you're interacting with a human, right? And I'm, I am a believer that most people wanna do good, good in the world, but there are bad actors. And uh, if you do not put the temptation in the hands of bad actors, then you've effectively um, solved the potential for a problem. So, this is an example where technology can actually assist this process versus, you know, detracting from it or becoming part of the problem, right? The, the collection of the data and then making that available is an example of maybe of where, where, where technology could actually be a part of the problem. So I think it's all, all with anything. It's how it's being used. It's how it's leveraged. It's how you think about, um, and right now, you know, companies need to set those standards, right? I think eventually laws and regulations will catch up, but right now companies are setting the standards around um, how data, data is being leveraged and, and what's being done about that. You know, you lead an organization and culture in that organization is very important to you. We've had this conversation about yeah. making sure that you don't have a toxic work environment for your employees and how employee experience ties into customer experience. Can you talk to me about uh, why not having a toxic work environment is important for the employee experience? Yeah, I mean, so toxicity, uh, I mean, toxicity is toxic, right? So, I mean, it's just, it's just such a waste of time and it, it becomes a, a drain for people to even want to come, you know, into, into the office. Right. Um, and for me, the bar isn't just not having a, you know, a toxic environment. Um, I want an engaging environment and I want engagement to mean more than, you know, the, the birthday cakes and the, um, the pizza parties or the, you know, the grill out barbecues during the, you know, during the summer. That's not necessarily what I ent entirely talk about when I say engagement. Important, right? I think, you know, uh, that kind of fun activities are important in a workplace. But when I talk about engagement, I feel like uh, the environment I am trying to foster and to create and trying to, you know, kind of kindle is, is, is one where people are constantly learning and challenging themselves. I have felt... I have felt moments in time where I've been in environments where I feel like I wasn't uh, able to, you know, to learn, right. Or that I was static. And, and for me, those have been miserable experiences. Um, and so when I talk about not only not having a toxic culture, but having an engagement culture, for me, that engagement is about how you engage um, all employees within an organization to, you know, adopt a spirit of learning um, and, and to challenge things. Like I, um, you know, I think, I still think of myself as a contact center associate, right? Because for me, that was just a couple of years ago. It wasn't, but, you know, for me, the, the way it feels like is a couple of years ago. I still feel like I'm 18 until I look in the mirror. So, you know, yeah, same, same. Right. And, um, I wake up every morning. I think that I'm, you know, 18, 19 years old, um, until, until the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, you know, for me, I had a lot of ideas and opinions as a contact center associate that I was scared to share. I didn't know how to share. I didn't know how to approach. I, uh, 
you know, didn't know how to present it properly. Um, I learned those skills over time, but you know, the ideas, the mind is still the same mind, right? Like, you know, the, the level of intellect I had, you know, when I was a contact center associate is still the same level of intellect I have now. The, the difference is I, through different experiences and to exposure to different things, have been able to fine tune how to apply that and how to communicate and how to, how to share my ideas and experiences in a, in a, in a manner that um, is palatable, right? And is, and is supportive in an organization. We have a value um, that we talk about and it's think independently, innovate together, innovate together. And what that means for me is the following. We've all been in meetings where we're trying to solve a problem and the vocal person in the room says, oh, this is the way we should solve the problem. And then everyone in the meeting sits there and says, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not thinking independently and innovating together. That is one person who thought, spoke, and innovated. That's what that is. And so what I talk about in, in the culture at Exceed is if we all just sit there and nod our heads, right? We're actually doing a disservice to the final outcome because even if my idea may not be accepted, it still is influential to the group. Just sharing what I think, my independent thoughts, what I come forward with, whether accepted or not is influential to the rest of the group. And you never know how one idea, right? That may not be the final idea, how that may actually snowball to somebody else being to say, oh, you know what? Arthur's onto something. I don't like his idea, but <laughs> what I will riff off of that is the following. And that's when you know you have a think independently, innovate together kind of culture when people are sharing their thoughts and you're riffing off of each other, right? And 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 that to me is 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 um is the culture of engagement that I'm trying to create. So what is your advice for someone who wants to fo uh, foster a positive company culture based on your experience, your insights from running your own business? I'm a I'm an individual who's had to all his life work through being very passionate about what he does. And sometimes that passion comes through in a not so positive way, right? Um, and it's in, for me, every time I um, lose my pragmatism, lose my level headedness, I always walk away from those interactions saying the only person who felt better around that interaction was me. I was the one that was letting off steam and everybody else who saw that it was a negative interaction for them. Right. And I, and I would say that for me is what I try to now hold back a lot. And I try to approach things more pragmatically, more level headedness. I've met leaders who are a hundred percent level headed and I respect them a hundred percent because it's not easy to do, especially when you're in a high performance type of culture, it's very difficult. And so my advice is, Make sure you're recognizing more of the positive than the negative, right? Don't be afraid to coach the negative, but coach it practically, right? And talk to people like they're individuals, right? Um, and don't let, the emo don't let your emotions get the better of you because there's nothing ever that c comes good from emotion controlling the conversation. Your emotions are okay. That's how you feel them, right? You have to recognize them, right? So I'm not saying that emotions are not, you know, a good thing, but you do as a leader have to control them. And you have to understand as a leader, unfortunately, you're always on stage. And so are your stage moments positive or are they negative? And if more of them are negative than positive, then there's probably an opportunity to flip that equation considerably. That was really, I, I love that. Um, looking at your stage moments. Yeah. That's beautifully said. Thank you. So Arthur, why would somebody reach out to you and how would they reach out to you? Why would somebody reach out to me? Well, 
Uh, so Exceed approaches customer experience with a with a with a different lens. So uh, the people who are reaching out to um, to me are to talk about our different approach towards you know customer experience. Uh, it comes from building an employee culture that's focused on learning and innovation, and that allows us to create this culture where. We're listening to people and the insights that they have from all the interactions that they support with customers for the different, you know, for the different brands we support. And the clients that are interested to come to me are those that want to learn about those insights and want to want a partner that brings those insights forward and thinks about how to do things differently. Um, a philosophy we have at Exceed is we like to work smarter, not harder. <laughs> um, we'd like to do less work. Um, and what that, what that means is we want to make things easier for everyone. So if we can, you know, automate things or make problems go away upstream so they don't exist and we don't even have to solve the problem for us, that's the big, better win than having an upset customer that we're just applying a band aid towards. So that's why somebody would come to me um, with uh, to to me or to my organization. Um, how they would come to, how they would come to me? Oh, that's simple. www.exceed.com. And since uh, we went through the name, I'll spell it again. <laughs> uh, I C X E E D I C X E E D exceed.com. Um, and you can actually chat with us right there online. Um, there's a way to get, get in touch. Uh, our email addresses are all, are all listed there. Uh, and if you just want to explore around, check us out there or any of our social media sites. We're on, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. Um, all with the same name, I C X E E D. <laughs> In case you were wondering, it's I C X E E D. And that's all of those are linked below. Uh, for those of you who are on YouTube and you see how fabulous we look, if you're not, I'm so glad that Arthur spelled it uh, a few times. <laughs> How's that for a plug? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, Arthur, thank you so much for joining us this week. Really appreciate it. Thank and for, for absolutely. And for everybody else, thank you. And we will see you again next week. As we wrap the episode up, we would like to take this time to thank you for joining us this week on Unexpected Journey. Our guest information will be linked in the episode description, along with a link to our company website, remoteevolution.com, and our host website, anbib.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on your favorite podcast app and on our YouTube channel so that you never miss an episode and we can continue to bring them to you. Let us know your thoughts on what we discussed in the comment section. And once again, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next week for another episode of Unexpected Journey.